Good morning. Whoa. How are you guys doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Well, you guys can stand up. And you guys can come on in from the foyer. And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Uh, we thank you, Lord, uh, that you're the Lord of all, that you're our Father, that you're the King of kings, and you're so worthy to be praised. And I thank you, God, for this opportunity for us all to be here together to worship. We don't get that that often, but we thank you, God, that we can come here and uh, just be with our brothers and sisters. And I pray, Father, for unity, just like you have that unity uh, you, Jesus, and the Father, you guys have that unity. I pray that we would have that unity as well and that you would uh, just bring that to this place. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, God. We thank you for uh, filling us, and we just ask for your Holy Spirit to manifest its presence here in this place, God, and uh, that we won't, be, we won't be afraid to worship, that we won't uh, feel insecure or anything like that, but that we would I realize that you've done so much for us, God, that you you love us, and we don't have to be afraid or fearful in this place. And so I thank you for that, and I thank you that you take away all our fear, all our shame, all our sin, and that you, you don't just cover it, but you wash it away. And I pray, God, that we can uh, just rest in that this morning and that we can rejoice. And it's in Jesus' my name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Capture my heart with this love Just 
It's God. Just pray that your presence will just fill this place, God. We 
know that all we need is you, God. So we pray that right now that you will just fill us all with your Holy Spirit and just an overwhelming joy and a peace, God. If we've had a rough week, that we will just rest in you right now, God, that this is a safe place. We all are family in this place. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit will be welcomed here right now, God. We know we can't do the service without you. We don't want to do the service without you, God. So we pray that we'll just be crying out for you right now, God that you will take us into the Holy of Holies, God, that we will be pure before you, God. If there's anything in us right now that is not clean, that you will cleanse us, God, and help us to get right with you right now, God. As we come into your sanctuary, we want to be right before you. We want to be that pure and spotless bride before you, God. Just thank you for how much you love us. Thank you for your mercy, God. Thank you for your grace. We just pray right now that we will worship you with all of our heart, that we won't care what anyone thinks about us, that we will just focus on you, God, that it's just between you and us. And we just thank you for your presence, and we just pray that you'll fill this place right now.
That's why I pray right now. Lord, I thank you, God, for this time. I thank you, God, that you give us that opportunity to come into your presence. And it's not just because of us. It's not anything because of us, but it's because of you, God. We thank you, God, that you tore that veil so that we can come into your presence. So I pray, God, that you'll take us past everything, all the pride, all the, just all the arrogance, everything, God. Take us past our selfishness. I just pray, God, that you'll bring us into the Holy of Holies right now. Lord, we just, we just want to sit in your presence, God, and magnify you and glorify you because you've done so much for us, God. And, and not even that, but just for who you are. We thank you, God, that we have a father like you. We thank you that we have you as our Lord and as our Savior. I just pray that we would just all rejoice in that, that we would uh, we would find peace in that, God, that we wouldn't be sad or sorrowful, but that we would be full of joy because of your presence, God. And we thank you that your presence brings that peace, your presence, uh, like, we know that when we're in your presence, God, I know that that fear just rushes away just pushed away and so I pray God that whatever is on your people's hearts whatever is maybe holding them back whatever is uh, maybe trying to stop us from worshiping you I pray God that you would just break through and you'll just touch our hearts God and that we would have our hearts open to you so I pray that as we sing this next song that we would realize what you've done for us God what you've paid paid the price to come to our rescue, God. We thank you uh, for being such a wonderful Savior. It's in Jesus' my name I pray. Jaco
Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap. Bless you, God. You guys may greet one another. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Doing good? Good time of worship? Well, God bless you guys. We love you. I better start my timer this time. All right. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. We're in Corinthians, finally. We were out of it because of Mother's Day, and then we were out. Of, we talked. I talked about worship for two weeks, and then uh, we then did um, we then did uh, uh, Father's Day last week, and so now we're back in Corinthians. So, First Corinthians chapter eight, verse one, and the title of today's message is "Knowledge Puffs Up." Knowledge puffs up. I don't know about you, but I am really blessed by Paul. How many are blessed by Paul? You should be because he wrote at least almost half. If you believe he wrote Hebrews like I do, he wrote o- over half of the New Testament. How, how many of you better like Paul because he wrote half of the New Testament? But he was an amazing letter writer. Is there anyone out there who's a good letter writer? I, I'm not a good letter writer. There, there we go. One, two. But, I mean, I am a terrible letter writer, and I write like a first grader. You know, when you guys do something nice, I always want to write something to you, but... I, I can't, you know, I, I did, how many remember Palm Pilots? Does anyone remember Palm Pilots? And you, all stylish, used to do weird stuff. And after I did that for a while, I wrote like a third grader again, and, and a first grader. I, I can't write, so anyway, but I am amazed by Paul and his encouraging letters and even correcting letters. But I heard this, I thought it was pretty interesting about letters. This guy, Den Chow Lee, he wrote his girlfriend, he, was, he had to leave her for work. He left his girlfriend for about a year. And he wrote her over 1,300 letters in one year. Isn't that amazing? Now that's a guy that us guys hate. Amen? Right. Okay. <laughs> 1,300 letters, and he did him special delivery. And where he was, special delivery used to be where the mailman would hand it to the person in person, would give it to them in person. So 1,300 letters he, this, uh, this, this lady received from her boyfriend. And he just loved her, but he had to be away from her, and he wanted to marry her so bad. Well, a year later, she was married to the postman. (laughs) I know it's sad, isn't it? But anyways, I thought it was kind of funny. So that's why I don't write letters, because I don't want that to happen. No, kidding. But after Paul has addressed his concerns for them, uh, we, we come to the second section of Paul's letter to the church of Corinth where he'll give the answers. Remember, he, they, they re- asked him six questions. And so we've already answered one. Does anyone remember what the one question we already answered we talked about for a couple weeks? What was it? 
<laughs> I love that. No, marriage. Remember marriage? We talked about marriage. So he answered the question about marriage. Can you have divorce? Can you, what do you do if you're married to a non-Christian? All this stuff. So he answered marriage in chapter 7. But now in chapters, these next three chapters, chapters 8, 9, and 10, he'll deal with Christian liberty. And how many know that that's a real important topic? Christian liberty, our freedom in Christ. And how many know the Bible will say that all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable? How many know that? We're, we're, we're in Christ where everything's forgiven, so things are lawful to us, but we have to question, is this profitable? Is it profitable for us? Is it profitable in our witness to others? And he's going to talk about our Christian liberty. Today, as I said, we're going to look at the second question. So let's start in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 8. Now concerning the things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Verse 2, and if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing. Yet as he ought to know. Verse 3, But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us today. Father God, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for this sweet time of worship. I ask that right now you would speak to me and you would speak through me, Lord. I thank you that, Lord, my cry is that, that when I speak, it would be your Holy Spirit speaking through me. That it would be a rhema word, a a specific word for a specific people at a specific time. And that people would leave this place saying, my goodness, God spoke to me today. God spoke to me through his word. And that everyone would be encouraged and everyone would sense your presence and everyone would feel the loving encouragement from your spirit. And they'd also feel the loving conviction where there needs to be conviction. I ask, oh God, that you would Make it clear to us. This is a deep topic, and I ask that your Holy Spirit of truth would lead us all into truth. We thank you, and we cry out to hear your voice. In Jesus' name. And Emory Greed said? Amen. Amen. I like amens, so just so you know. Amen. So so it's funny. He goes, goes, someone said, I'm not used to an amen church. But you know what amen means, right? It means it's so, or so be it, right? So be it. And so we want, we're so amen means so be it. So when I say amen, you're not just going amen just to say amen to be a charismatic. You're saying amen that you agree with what that you're saying amen. That's the word of God. In chapters 8 and 10, Paul uses, I said, the question from, of the Corinthian church that asked him about meat sacrifice to idols. Meat sacrifice to idols. To address a larger issue of Christian liberty or freedom. Within the city of Corinth, there was a number of temples dedicated to various gods, false gods, and idols like Aphrodite, Zeus, Apollo, you know, and Diana, which is Aphrodite, and and they would sacrifice animals to them. And hear this, just like the Lord, they would sacrifice the best animals. They couldn't have a blemish. These animals would have to be perfect. So they would be the best choices of meat. And they would sacrifice these animals to these false gods, and a portion of the meat would be consumed on the altar, would be burned. Another portion would be given to the priest, but anything the priest couldn't do, the remainder of the sacrifice would be sold in the marketplaces, these places called shambles, and this was at the temple a lot of times, right outside it, and the meat would be sold at a very reduced rate. And how many know Christians love a bargain, amen? Amen. And so these Christians are saying, man, this is really good meat, but it's sacrificed to an idol, but it's really cheap. And, he, and here's the conflict. Here, here, here it is. So think about it. So you got, a non, you, got, you got baby Christians who maybe worshiped at these temples in Corinth, and now they see Christians who know their liberty because we're going to see in this chapter next week, we're going to see that he says, and we're going to see today, that meat is meat is meat. How many know? Jesus says, it's not what goes into you that defiles you, it's what comes out of you. So there's no such thing as possessed meat. How how many know that? You you can't get possessed meat. But but these people who used to worship at these temples, watching a Christian buy meat from them, it was a conflict to them. How many can understand that? It was hard. Like, how can you go there? How can you do that? That's so evil. That place is evil. That's a false god. I worshipped a false god for years, and I can't go back there. 
It reminds me of when I was a brand new Christian. And I was a partier, and I was pretty popular. I know it's hard to believe, but I was pretty popular in partying. And, and so when I got saved, all the people who got, were my friends who were Christians, that, you know, when I became a Christian, they all said, hey, Craig, let's go to the parties to witness. Now, how many know they really wanted just to party? They were kind of going away from God, and they, and they saw me as their backstage pass to party. So I went with them a few times being, ooh, not knowing anything. And then I just watched. We didn't do a whole lot of witnessing. And a lot of my friends were trying to get me to drink again and party again. And I said to them, finally, no, I don't want to do that. Why? Because God delivered me from that. I didn't want to go back to what I'd gotten delivered from. So I was like, no, I don't want to go back to that temple. I don't want to go back to my house of worship of partying. And that's the thing. So these people said, well, let's witness. How many know there isn't many powerful bar ministries? You know, usually the bar ministers to you, I love you, man. Right? It, it usually... They win ministering to you, not you win ministering to them. And how many know, witnessing someone who's drunk isn't a good thing, right? And you ever notice that? You talk to some of the transits here, they're drunk. They know more about the Bible than we do, okay? I mean, they'll be telling me, oh, sorry, wrong scripture, Craig. I mean, they, you know, they can't talk clear, but they know everything. And so, so there's, you see the dilemma. So they're buying this reduced great meat at reduced prices, but yet the conflict of can you buy meat that's sacrificed to a false god, an idol? It was an issue concerning meat that was sold in pagan temple stores that the Corinthians were asking Paul about. about. Let's look at verse 1 again. Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. So we all know, a lot of us know the word. He's saying you know the word. But knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. I like how the New Living says the last part of verse 1. It says, but while knowledge makes us feel important, but it's love that strengthens the church. Isn't that good? How many of you, like me, don't like a know-it-all? Right? I have people coming up, uh, excuse me, Pastor Craig, uh, sorry, you quoted that wrong. I, I don't like that, okay? I don't like it. You know what I mean? I just, I don't like the know-it-all. Excuse me, uh, the Greek uh, really means this. You know, I don't like that Poindexter knows everything about everything, right? And, and you know, and I mean, if I'm wrong, I, I want to be corrected, but just, just, you know what I mean, nitpicky things, silly things. Before answering the Corinthians' question concerning meat sacrificed to idols, Paul begins by addressing the foundational issue that at the very beginning of his discussion of liberty, of Christian liberty and freedom, Paul makes it clear that knowledge puffs up, but love edifies or builds up. So he says, if meeting, he'll say later in this chapter, if eating meat caused my brother to stumble in the Lord, then I'll never eat meat again. Do you hear the heart of Paul? He's saying, I have liberty. He's going to say, I have liberty to eat meat sacrifice. It's just meat. But if it causes my weaker brother to stumble then I will never eat meat again. How many, how many know this would be a lot more loving church if we all had that heart? But sometimes we go, hey, I have freedom and I don't care what they say. How many know, remember, remember what, um, uh, who was it? I can't think, Cain and Abel. He says, am I my brother's keeper? And the answer is what? Yeah, you are. You're concerned. You need to, now hear me. If we're just doing good things to be seen by people, oh, to try to look good, how many know that's, that's hypocrisy? But if I'm saying I'm concerned of what I do affects you, then that's good. How many know that? If I'm concerned, I don't want to cause you to stumble. Because how many know, uh, people, you know, people say, oh, pastors, they're just human beings just like us. How many know, if I do things that you do, sometimes you get really mad at me. Amen? Amen. You can have a beer or two, but if you see me at a bar, or if you see me drinking a beer, you go, oh, pastor. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I've. I never thought, you know, and isn't it weird? Because what I do, as I said last week, what I do in moderation, a lot of you will do in excess. And you'll use me, right, as a template. If you see me get angry, you'll say, see, Pastor Greg gets angry, so I can get angry. Hey, you know, all right? And we have to realize that I have to realize that, that the Bible says, let there be few teachers who incur stricter judgment. Now, that means in doctrine, but I mean also in life because people are watching. And you can say, oh, it's not right, it's not fair, but people are, and you know, and you have to realize that. People, you know, watch me. And uh, we watch the pastor. Yeah, there you go, there you go. We watch you. <laughs> but he says, therefore, there are many Christians today who think they know it all. 
and they'll tell you everything about anything. They'll tell you all about what, what, what version of the Bible to read. You ever heard that? Yeah. King James only, yeah. right? And they'll say, that's the only official version. Or they'll say, you got to do this. Or Calvinist. Are you Calvinist or Arminius? And, you know, and most people don't care, but they'll say, hey, you got to know this. And if you don't know this, you know, you're, you're out of it. I'll never forget, I was at Bible college. And uh, I remember some charismatics, it was a Baptist Bible college, and some charismatics kind of snuck in. And one day they said to me, I'm a brand new Christian. And they go, are you spirit-filled? And I'm a Baptist, so I knew the answer, yes. Because Ephesians 1.12 says you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And I said, I'm, yes, I am baptized with the Holy Spirit. I'm filled with the Spirit. And so all of a sudden I started speaking in tongues. Well, I didn't know what tongues was. I didn't know. I'm like, what? What, what, you, what is this? You know, blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm like, what is that? And then I, they go, oh, oh my goodness, Craig. You're not saved. How many know I then went to my dean, oh, I'm not saved. And then he told, you know, Baptist, he said, well, let me tell you the truth. Tongues is not for today. Now we're not going to forbid it, but it's the least of the gifts. How many know after that I went as a tongue-talking, persecuting Christian. Man, I was like Paul against Christians. Man, you're a tongue-talker. I'm coming after you. I went to Grace Chapel here to persecute them for speaking in tongues, and that's when I got saved. Now I'm one of those tongue-talkers, right? And, And hear this. I'll say to you, if that's weird to you, just know this. When I was a Baptist and I would hear that, and they would say, oh, you know, tongues is the least of the gifts, and devalidate it, and blah, blah, blah. How many know this? Paul says, I speak in tongues more than you all. And then he says, I wish that you all spoke in tongues. Why would Paul, who wrote half the New Testament, say, if it's not a big deal, why do he say, I speak in tongues more than you all, I wish you all spoke in tongues? And so when I hearing that as a Baptist, I said, Lord, I want to know, is this for today or not? And if it is, I want it. And if it's not, I don't want it. And that's all I ask you to do, right? All I ask you to do is be open to whatever is God, right? Is that cool? Just say, Lord, if it's you, I want it, you know. And, and hear this. You cannot speak in tongues and be saved. Amen? But I want to tell you, I believe, as it says in Jude 20, it says, build yourself up in your most holy faith by what? Praying in the Spirit. And those of you who have the gift of tongues know how powerful it is because it helps you to pray when you don't know how to pray. And so uh, we want to make sure, you know, at Calvary, we don't talk about this much because it's so offensive. But how many know... If it is in the Word and it's God, we should talk about it. Amen? Amen? We shouldn't be ashamed of it. But, but so there's people that know everything about anything, but hear this. There are a lot of times we notice they're not very loving. A lot of these people are like cactuses. They have many very fine points, <laughs> but they're hard to love. They're hard to hug. They're hard to get close to. Have you noticed that? And we want to make sure that we have sound doctrine, but we want to make sure we love people with it. I mean, how many know you can be right and be wrong in how you present truth? I Many times, because I, I had one person say to me, Craig, you love to speak the truth, but sometimes you don't speak the truth in love. How, how many know that's true? Some of you go, amen. Right? But, no, but we need to make sure we speak, because think of this. The opposite is what? If we say, oh, we love, but we don't speak the truth to someone? Someone's in blatant sin and we don't want to make them mad at us. How many know that's not love either? Because we're loving them all the way to hell. But we need to make sure that our love is what? We speak the hard things to what? Edify, to build up, to bring them along, to come. You know, the Bible says, calls the Holy Spirit the paraclete, or as David says, the parcelate. Okay, but, you know, if you know David, he always makes up words. It's pretty cute. But he was telling me, he goes, yeah, I studied the parcelate today. I go, Parcelate? What's the part? And Kevin goes, you mean the paraclete? But the paraclete is the Holy Spirit. It's the one who comes alongside you. How many know the Holy Spirit comes alongside you? Don't you love it? And he just guides you and he directs you and he speaks to you and says, hey, don't go there. Don't do this. Do this. Walk here. And that's the way we are. We're to come alongside. We're not to come alongside and club people. We're to come alongside in love and speak the truth and kind of guide them, direct them into truth. Amen. I love, as I said last week, an attitude is easier caught than taught. We should lovingly come alongside them gently and speak the truth in love to them. And, you know, the thing that hits me is, think about this, Jesus, how cool Jesus is. You all know that, how cool he is. But he took 613 commandments in the Old Testament. Then he reduced them to to 10. 
How many have a hard time memorizing the Ten Commandments, right? But then he took those 13, 613, 10, and then he took them to two. And what are the two great commandments? The, everything. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what? Love your neighbor as yourself. So hear that. And he says, if you do that, you fulfill the law of the Old Testament and the New. From Genesis to Revelation, you fulfill it all if you'll love God with all your heart and love your neighbor yourself. Doesn't that make life easy? Now, it's easy to know that, but how many know loving sometimes a little, takes a little work, right? But we need to realize that that's it. So whenever you, so make sure, here this is what I'm learning from God. Everything you do in Christ should be motivated in love. I read my Bible because I love God. I, read, I, I obey God. Why? What did you say? Obey me because what? You love me. If you love me, obey. So everything you do, why do you witness? Not because you got to, because you love God and want to. So everything you do should be based in love. And as I told you a couple weeks ago, I think I did, that I realized a lot of my Christianity got into this perfectionism, kind of this performance-based Christianity, that I need to pray this much every day, and I need to read this much every day, and it got into this craziness. Now hear me, here's the balance. There's a lot of people that say, hey, God loves me, so why change a thing? How many know you should change if you're truly in Christ? Amen? Because 1 John 2 says, anyone who says he's come to know him must walk in the same manner as he does. So every day you should be coming more like Christ, but you don't do it to get God's favor. You do it because you are favored and you love him and you just want to be more like him. Amen? Amen. So do you see the difference? It's love. It's not this law and heaviness and this hard yoke. It's not the Pharisees. It's a loving thing. Does that make sense to you? Verse 2 if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know. I love what one person said this. He says, true knowledge, I think it was um, Tozer, said true knowledge is being aware of your ignorance. Isn't that good? True knowledge is realizing you don't know anything. If you find someone who says, yeah, I kind of know a lot, they're really ignorant. Remember, remember Kansas? If I claim to be a wise man... It surely shows that I don't know. As soon as you think you're wise, you're not. But if you realize, man, I, the more I get to know God, the more I love what Billy Graham said, the more I get to know God, the more I see how little I know. Isn't that true? I used to, when I was young, the first year of Christ after Bible college, our first two years of Bible college, I was like, I knew everything. I didn't know why these pastors had problems. I knew everything. I had the answer for everything. But now that I've been in ministry 36 years, I know nothing. Nothing. I don't know a thing. I mean, I can answer questions, but I, sometimes it, I tell Kevin all the time, I go, I thought it would get easier as I get older. I, 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 think, I forget who it was. It was, uh, uh, what's his name? Watchman Nee. He said, the older I get, the more cloudy things become. I'm like, I don't like hearing that. I want things to become clearer. I want things to be more sharp, and I want to be able to answer questions quicker. But how many know this? The older you get, the more you realize Man, God's big, and I'm small, and wow, you know, he just, he, it just, you know, but it's a good thing, because why? It hopefully makes us remember to depend on God, as we'll see in a moment. There you go. Another way to say this is anyone who claims to know all the answers shows they really don't know very much at all. Paul's saying here, he's speaking to the prideful religious people of Corinth that say, hey, I have liberty. I can eat this meat, and I don't care about my weaker brother. Hear this. I want to say this real quick. We're, gonna, we're not going to look at this today, but we'll look at it next week. But hear this. Isn't it funny? We think the people that don't do this and don't do that and don't go here and don't eat that, that they're the strong brother. But Paul says the brother who can't eat the meat sacrificed now is the weaker brother. But he's saying, even though you have understanding, even though you have Christian liberty and clarity, you should love your weaker brother and not want to cause them to stumble. Amen? If you have knowledge, you should say, hey, I'm not going to crush someone over the head because I have knowledge and go, you're a bonehead. I don't care about you. I'm going to say I care about you, so therefore I'm not going to do that. Amen? Think about what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 1. He says, if I can speak with the tongues of men and tongues of angels, but I do not have love, I'm like a clanging cymbal or a crashing gong. I'm just making noise. I'll tell you this, guys. I realize, you know, I'm getting soft in my old age, you know, not just physically. But I'm get, I realize it's all about love. I realize, you know what God said, you know, and 
Kate, where's Casey? Casey, hey, amen. But I mean, where's Casey? Is he gone? He's gone. He, oh, there he is. Casey. But, but I'll never forget. I said, I go, it's, it's, God reminded me. He goes, it's, your, it's my love that drew you. Now let my love through you draw others. And I'm like, no, God, no. I said, I was like, okay. You know, it's hard sometimes because how many can say humbly that the church is kind of in a weird state? I mean, we're kind of in a liberal state. We can do whatever we want. We're, we're not sure if homosexuality is wrong. We're not sure if divorce is wrong. We, we just say, hey, live and let live. How many know that's wrong? But it's how do you address these issues but do it in a loving way? That's the question of the ages. That is, hear this, it's the Holy Spirit. A.W. Tozer said it this way. Satan will try to take us or our flesh one extreme or the other, either too harsh or too liberal. But it's only the Holy Spirit that gives us balance. I love this saying too. Love without law is what? Liberalism. But law without love is legalism. We need balance. We need the balance. We need love and law. And hear this, guys. Law is for, I just read in Galatians, Law is for what? Or, sorry, Timothy. Law is for the what? Lawbreaker. If you're walking by the Spirit, how many know you're not under the law? Because you'll be led by the Holy Spirit of truth. You'll walk by the Spirit. But if you're, someone's in blatant sin, you need to then speak in love the law to them. Amen? We came in, but okay. I'll take it. I find it interesting that in verse 4 of chapter 8 here, Paul says, Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other God but one. So he's sort of saying that an idol is nothing. It's, how many know that stone statue or that steel statue or the gold statue, whatever it is, it's nothing. How many know that? It's just, a, a, it's just a statue. And isn't it funny, as Isaiah says, the very wood you make fire with, you carve an idol and worship it. That's sort of weird. It's sort of weird that you could burn your idol and, and it's not going to get out. And go, hey, what are you doing? It, it's just an idol. It's empty. And he says that the people who make them are as stupid as their idol. How many know that idol doesn't do anything? Do you remember when they brought the ark into the, to Dagon's temple? Does anyone remember that story? And Dagon fell face fun, and then they put him back up, and then he fell again, and then finally his arms broke off and his legs. How I many you know that's a bad idol? When your God fall, when your God is falling down, arms are cracking off, you need to get a new idol. Well, you shouldn't get an idol, but you need a new God, I should say. Right? He says that idols are nothing, so we shouldn't worry about eating meat sacrificed to them. But Paul is saying here that there are higher principles here. And that principle of, the principle that is higher is love. That's the real principle here. That you have liberty, but make sure you do everything out of love. Love for your brothers. Love for your sisters in Christ. How many, what did Jesus say? They will know your you are my disciples by your great doctrine. No, he says, by your what? Love. Now hear me, it doesn't mean don't know the word. Don't go that way. I, don't, I heard someone once say, I don't, I'm not into doctrine, man. I'm just into, the, I'm into Jesus. Excuse me, who's the word become flesh? Jesus. So if you love Jesus, you should what? Love his word. But we don't use his word to bash people in the head. We use the word to know him and to help direct people into his will as we walk in his will. Verse 3. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. How many like to be known by God? You know, I want to be known by God. That's why I preached two weeks on worship, because hear this, but do you hear that? Anyone who loves God, this one is known by him. If you want to be known by God, then worship God. Then tell God how much you love him. Bow down before him. Cry to him. Tell him how, much, how good he is. Thank him. Today I woke up. Have you ever woken up in a, just a rough day? I woke up today just, rah, rah, everything's going wrong. The pools, were, the, the dog peed on my rug. Oh, rah, rah, that puppy, Morgan's puppy, rah, right? And I'm just like frustrated. And then the Lord's like, yeah, isn't it nice you have a pool to have a problem with? Isn't it nice you got a puppy? Isn't it nice you have a rug that he could pee on? And I'm just going, man, Lord, I'm sorry. There's people who are starving to death today, and I'm frustrated because I have a puppy that was given to us that pees on the rug. I have a pool. Oh, I can't believe this pool and the tree. I mean, and I just said, God, forgive me for how unthankful and ungrateful I am. 
We need to just worship him and anyone who loves God. Why was David a man for God's own heart? Now, if you're a hardcore Calvinist, you'll say, because God chose him to be. No, it says in Acts 6, because he chose, he, he listened to God's voice and did everything God commanded him to do. Didn't David worship God? All the time. And then he listened to his voice and he did what he said most of the time, except for Bathsheba part, right? But he did mostly what God said. How do we know you can be known by God? You can be favored by God because what? You love him. You worship him. You follow him. On one hand, Paul will say, because idols are nothing, go ahead and eat meat offered to them. But on the other hand, he'll say, they're indeed demonic forces. That he's saying, if it caused your brother to stumble, don't do it. But he says this, indeed, there are demonic forces behind these idols. How do we know that? The idol is nothing, but there is demonic forces behind them. I want to tell you this real simple. Make life simple. How many like life simple? There's only two religions in the world. God and Satan. Now, Satan has a lot of names for his religions, but there's only two powers in the, in the universe. How many know that? Now, we think, no, there's God's power, my power, and Satan's power. How many know? As I said a couple weeks ago, the kingdom of self is whose power? Satan's. What did Satan say in Isaiah 14? I will make myself like the Most High God. Whenever you walk in, I did it my way, like Frank Sinatra, you're walking in the kingdom of self, which is the kingdom of Satan. So there's only two powers. But he's saying these false gods, if there's any power behind them, it's demonic. And he's going to say, I don't want you to hang out with these places because he's saying there's nothing to the meat, but if you hang out in these places, you're fellowshipping with demons, and I don't want you to do that. And he's going to say that in chapter 10, verse 20. So what are the Corinthians to do? Do you hear? How many many get this, as I always say? The Bible is not full of contradictions, but it's full of paradoxes. How many hear that? Right? I always tell you the one. My favorite one is Isaiah 9, 6. Jesus will be what? The Prince of Peace. Oh, peace. Love it. And then it says, Jesus says about himself in, in, in Matthew 10, I have not come to bring peace but a sword. What does our Western mind say? Oh, contradiction. But it's no. At times when someone's broken like the woman caught in adultery, peaceful, merciful, gentle. But when you accept Jesus, if you're a Muslim, and you accept Jesus, how many know there's going to be some Jesus, not Jesus, but accepting him is going to make some turmoil in your house. Do you see that? So we have to realize, and I love this, the Hebrew mindset has no problem with A being right and B being right at times. But our Western mindset has what? A's right, and if that A's right, then B's wrong. we got to get past that. Amen? we got to be able to believe that there's paradoxes. Not contradiction, but paradoxes. So what's the answer? Well, I believe the answer is found in Genesis 2.17. What was the tree which Adam and Eve, remember this? Remember Adam and Eve could eat from any tree, but there was one tree they couldn't eat from, and what was that tree? The knowledge of good and evil. And don't you love Satan? If you're not sure Satan is a liar, what do you say? Is it true you can't eat from any of the trees? Don't you love that exactly? No, one tree. I can eat from every tree but one. And hear this, guys, real quick. Why did God allow that? Some people say, why did God allow that? Why did a loving God? Because if there was no choice to rebel against him, it would be forced love. It would be rape. How many know love has to have a choice? If I'm the only man on earth and Teresa says, I love you, I'm going to think, well, she, does she love me just because, I know, is it just for my body? No, okay, no. I'm going to say, is it just because I'm the only man on earth? Or is it because she really loves me? So God allowed that tree to say, do these people really love me for me? But he says, I'm going to allow this tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of it, that will be a sign to me that you don't want to follow me and go my way. And how we know God gives you that. Isn't it amazing how people want God to give them free will, and then when he gives free will and lets bad things happen, people go, how could a loving God allow us to do that? Isn't that crazy? But if God stopped them, if all of a sudden they're going, hey, I want to look at pornography. Why can't I look at pornography? They would be mad at that, right? Why, why, why is God stopping me? We can't have it both ways. We all love free will. We all love choice. But we've got to realize with choice means that people can do bad things and do bad things that affect us. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yet once they disobeyed God and ate from this tree, they immediately, hear this, thought 
that they knew good from evil. How many knows? They knew, you know, they say we use, what, one-tenth of our brain? Can you imagine how smart Adam was before he sinned? He named all the animals of the earth in one day. I couldn't even say all the names in one day. He named them in one day. That's pretty amazing. One day. And think about, I mean, you know, I, don't, I can't imagine how smart he was. But now he thinks, you know, I know, right? From remember, remember what Satan said? And this is the thing of all Mormonism, right? A lot of isms is what? You will be like God. You'll be like God. You'll know good from evil. You'll know everything. How many know Adam and Eve ate from the tree, and he knew good from evil. He was aware of things, but he didn't know all things. He, if anything, he dumbed it down. He then become dull. You remember Jesus says, why are you so dull? He became stupid after that. Though they, they would know right from wrong without having, hear this, this is the key, without depending on the Father as they had. Think about that. They used to just walk. Remember Adam used to walk with God in the cool of the day. And he'd just say, you know, just like a son and father. You know, Morgan used to walk with my grandma. And he used to walk and it's so cute. But he used to have like a little talk like this. And so he'd say, what them that? He'd look at a bird. What them that, grandma? What them that? How many know that was what Adam was? What them that? What am that? What do I do with this wife? What am that? You know, he'd ask, what do I, everything, he would just talk with God and walk with God. And he just fellowship with God and ask God everything. And how many, do you realize God wants you to do that? He, he can say, I, how many times I got to tell you boneheads and stuff? He loves fellowshipping with us. He loves, that's what he loves. It's fellowship. It's not, you know, it's not doing all this stuff for him. It's, it's the fellowship. And so now suddenly, they suddenly knowing they were then what? Because they had knowledge, they knew that they were naked. And what did they do? They hid from God. They hid from God. The result, intimacy with the Father, with their Heavenly Father, was broken and sadly lost. Hear this, church. So too, if I'm not so careful, if you're not so careful, even biblical knowledge and theological understanding will make us less dependent on God. Amen? Because why? I know right and wrong. I'm chosen. I, I, I. You know what? I want to tell you this real quick. When I first got saved, I was, I I mean, I don't even know what reading level I was at, but I was a messed up puppy from drugs. And I was never a good reader. And I, when I came to know Christ, it took me, I went through the book of John. I think it took me a month to go because I wanted to read it to understand. I did just, you know, some people just read and go, I have no idea. I would read to understand, but it took me forever. But you know what I did? I would hold that Bible in my chest and I'd say, God, speak to me. Holy Spirit, someone told me, the Holy Spirit's a teacher and said, just ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And I want to tell you this, I knew things that I'd never read. And people who are Christians say, how did you know that? You've only read John, you said. And I go, I just know. Because why? The Holy Spirit taught me. But you know what I do now? I don't need to pray anymore because I know now. Do you see? No, I'm saying that to say. Do you see it? I know now. I don't need to depend on God because I've been to Bible college. I've been doing this for 36 years. Now, some of you guys go, if you're honest, you're the same way, right? The parcel it, right? I mean, you know, the, we, we know. And I realize, oh my goodness, the more I know, the more I see how little I know. I realize that, oh my goodness, what has happened? And today I was just weeping, saying, God, get me back to, as David prayed, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Or I said, restore to me that innocent heart that just said, what to that? Lord, tell me. I need help. Not that I don't read the Word. I'm not saying that. But I read the Word with the Spirit. And I say, God, help me. Lead me. Guide me. I, I don't say, oh, I have, uh, sorry, God, I know good from evil now. I don't need you. And isn't it weird how we do that? You notice that? Some people just do all the Spirit and no Word. And some people do all Word and no Spirit. We need both. This knowledge of thinking we know it all will make us less dependent on God through prayer. We won't need to pray as much because we know right from wrong. We know how to make our decisions without God. It will make us less a lover of God because we don't need him. We don't realize that he's our father. Without his help, we can do nothing. 
It'll make us less a lover of his people because we don't realize, we don't value people. We're only about us and puffed up with our knowledge. And as I said, it makes us less dependent on our Father because we mistakenly think that we can handle any given situation on the basis of our own knowledge and understanding. Isn't that amazing? Do you notice how we in life, we get insurance, we do this, we do, do you realize how much we try to eliminate God from our life? We try to make everything so secure. Do you know why I think the Jewish people were so close to God? Because they were an agrarian society. They would grow fields and crops. How many know if you're dependent on the earth for your food, it makes you, you will be, right? If there's, if there's a drought, you're going to be crying to God for rain. Because you can't just hook up and get an irrigation system. You've got to trust God to bring rain. You see how we've sort of gotten away. We, we just, we, we don't need God as much anymore. But I want to tell you this, the wise man, the wise woman realizes, even though I might not technically need God every second like they did as much, but I really do need God. Amen. Look at our country with all our technology, and we still have families, you know, families falling apart, child abuse, unwed mothers, you know, everything is still crazy with all our technology, with all our, quote, evolving, as the evolutionists would say. How many know we're really not evolving as a people? Because why? We're not declaring our dependency on God. Jeremiah 9.23 says this. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. Verse 24. But let him who glories, glory in this, that he understands and knows me. Isn't that good? You want to glory? Glory that you know God. Not, not just know about Him, but you know God. You talk to God. You walk with God. You know Him. The word know here speaks of intimacy like a man knows his wife. Intimacy. Closeness. Not just knowing about like you know about George Washington, but you know them intimately. You know their heart. You know their likes and dislikes. You know them. There are many people who, as I said, know about the Lord, but they don't really know the Father intimately. They don't know him like a loving father. And as I said last week, a lot of times the way we view our earthly father is the way we view our heavenly father. And I'm here to tell you that is that we, why do we all love that song, he's a good, good father, because a lot of us didn't have a good father. But I want to tell you, declare that, sing that song. Sing it on your own and say, I want that truth to be real in my heart to where I go. Even if my earthly father wasn't a good father, my heavenly father is a good father always. Amen? Yeah, you can clap. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, he said, the people said, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we heal in your name? Didn't we do great signs and wonders in your name? And what is Jesus going to say? Isn't that amazing that they did these amazing things? But he says, depart from me. I never Knew you. That word know there is gnoskos. It means, again, like a wife or a husband knowing his wife. Intimacy. It literally means intimacy. Closeness. Oneness. He says, I never knew you. Yes, you worked for me. Yes, and I'm paraphrasing this. Yes, you knew about me, but you had no real relation with me that was intimate and sincere. Isn't that amazing? I don't know about you guys, but it's hard for me. You know, when I hear about John snuggling up to God, that's a little weird to me. Any other guys out there, that's a little weird, right? I think I could hug Jesus, but to just put my head in his lap, that would be a little weird. But how many know, guys, God's called us to be a bride, too? Now, wives can understand that. Women can understand that. Oh, yeah, oh, geez, oh, right? And that's probably why they have a close relationship a lot of times in us. But how many know, for us as a guy, it's hard to think that we're to be that loving bride to Christ. We're to be affectionate and we're to be waiting for him. We're to be longing to do his will. And I want to tell you, we got to get to that. We got to realize that we are the bride of Christ, not just the women. We men are the bride of Christ too. Amen? Amen. Got a little quiet on me there, but I love it. <laughs> My fellow students of the word, grow in the knowledge of the Lord. I love that this is a Bible teaching church. I love that you love the word. I love that I hear pages flip. I love that. Become solid in the word. But as you do, make sure that love has the priority, is the highest priority of your life. 
that you do everything in love, not out of spiritual pride or look at how much I know the Word of God. How many know that we're not to study the Word to be able to win at Bible tri- trivia? We're supposed to know the Word of God because we what? Love God. We love God, and we want to learn how to love his people his way. But that you and I should excel in our love for God and our love for his people. That's what we should be working towards. And hear this. Let the word do its perfect work of either confirming God's leading in your life or correcting your misunderstanding of his leading. Let me give you an example of this. If all of a sudden I'm reading the, if all of a sudden I'm hearing from God, I'm praying, and I hear God say, "You need to love his, my people more. You need to love them." And I go, "Oh, okay, yeah, I feel, yeah, God, Amen." I hear that. Then I read the Word that day, and I hear, "Love your neighbors yourself." I go, "Oh, yeah, oh, it confirmed what I heard from God." Do you get it? That's what the Word of God should do. But then say, I, I think I hear from God, and I think, "Hey, you know, uh, you know, my mother-in-law, you know, she treats me bad, and so." smite the mother-in-law. No, I think, you know, get rid of her or, or hate her or whatever. And I'm thinking this, and then I read what? Oh, I thought that was God. Oh, hate my mother-in-law. And the Bible says what? Love your enemies. Pray for her broomstick. No, I'm kidding. I'm just, no, I'm just what? No, but I said, love her, right? I'm just making sure you're awake. I've got pain. No, okay. But, no, I'm just kidding. But, you know, love her. And I realize that, and that corrects my misunderstanding of what I feel is God. How, how many know you guys think, I've heard guys are so cute. I, I can tell you so many stories of people say, I really feel it's the Lord that I do this. this uh, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, sorry, so cute. This, this, this really pretty black girl used to come to our church, and this one guy who's single, he just goes, he goes, yeah, I really feel from God she's supposed to be my wife, and I'm supposed to date her, and we're going to be married. And I go, huh. I go, well, she just left yesterday. Isn't that weird how we hear it? She goes, no, she's going to be here. We're going to get married. And I'm like, no, no. You know, sometimes we hear things. How many, how many, anybody out there had the thing where God said, you're supposed to marry me? Anyone had that out there? One person? I said, yeah, I said, my wife raised her hand. Thank you, honey. Ah, oh, that's great. You were supposed to. Okay. But no. <laughs> anyway. No one's had that? Seriously? Okay, there you go. A couple, good. But man, I t- it's funny. This girl said that to me once, and I go, that is funny because God hasn't said a word to me about it. But she didn't like that. But anyway, where was I? Oh, there you go. Well, I was right, though. <laughs> so you just obeyed. But, no, okay. but the word must never be a substitute for our walking with him. Do you hear that? The word must never be a substitute for walking with him. And another way, too, the walking with him must never be a substitute from reading the word. You need both, walking and reading. Not one or the other, but both. Walking with him day by day or talking with him about every situation. And isn't that amazing? Do you realize how much we go through life with ever, without ever talking to the Lord? We just go through a hard day. And what does the Bible say in 1 Peter 5, 7? It says, cast all your cares and worries upon the Lord, for he cares for you. I was, I was listening to George Mueller the other day on YouTube, and George Mueller said that, that that was his verse that helped him to cast, take everything to God in prayer, and learn the life of faith. But a lot of times we don't even bring our problems to God. You notice you freak out, and all of a sudden, oh yeah, maybe God. We should be bringing every problem to God. Not just saving the big problems, but everything to God. Right? Everything to God. We need that great intimacy and dependency, lest our life become all about the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, knowing stuff on our own so we don't need God, which in turn means that we sadly become a hard-hearted Pharisee. Isn't that sad? Think, do you ever, I, wrote a, I had a sermon once called, you know, there was, remember the Stones had a song called Sympathy for the Devil? Well, that's not a good song, but, but, but I had a sermon called Sympathy for the Pharisee. Do you know the Pharisees were the, they were like us trying to be, they were the set apart ones. That's what Pharisee means, set apart ones. They were the conservatives. They were the ones really living for God. But here's what happened. They got so into the law of God that they lost the God of the word. Isn't that sad? They, a lot of them memorized the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. I can't even memorize a verse. They memorized books. And yet they missed Jesus. How many know that's sad? 
They missed, they were an enemy of Jesus, and yet they studied the word, they knew the word, they memorized the word, they knew every intricacy of the word, but yet they missed the God of the word. That should scare some of us, especially pastors like me. Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said this, I love this verse, John 5, 39. He said to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you, you think that they give you eternal life. Hear me, guys, if you're reading the scriptures thinking you have eternal life from reading your one-year Bible, no. But the scriptures point to me. How many like that? So when you read the scripture, look for Jesus. Read to see Jesus. How many know Jesus is laced throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament? Look for Jesus wherever you are. Look for the heart of God. Look to see Jesus in the word of God. Isaiah 30 verse 1 says, Woe to the rebellious children of Israel, says the Lord, who take counsel or seek knowledge, but not of me. Hear this. The Assyrians were coming down. They were getting ready to attack Israel. What did Israel do? They went to Egypt and sought an alliance with Egypt and said, hey, give us counsel. What do we do? Protect us. We'll give you money. We'll give you gold. Protect us. And he says, because of that, it's vanity. How many know God gets offended when you turn to other things beside him? How many know sometimes we get a bad report? And hear me, guys. Sometimes you guys take me. Hear me. But sometimes we get a medical report and we just hear it and we just trust whatever the doctor says. How many know we need to also counsel with God and hear what God says? Because sometimes God says the totally opposite of what the people... And we need... Now, I'm not saying if someone's bleeding to death, don't go, let's pray right now. No, no. But I'm saying is we should seek the Lord. Amen? Sometimes some people will be sick and they never ask for prayer. What does the Bible say in James? You have not because you what? Ask not. And then I pray for people and they go, well, thank God for doctors. And they didn't even receive it. How many of our God still heals? But we have to have faith, amen? And we have to ask God. George is an example of that. I don't know where George is. George here today? But George is an example of that, of healing. Some of you know George Zapata. But we need to ask God. Here's what he says in verse 21 of that chapter of Isaiah 30. He says, your ears, so he's correcting them. They go their own way. Then he says this in verse 21. Your ears shall hear a word behind you talking about the Holy Spirit, saying this is the way you should walk. Turn to the left or turn to the right. Do you hear that? He's saying that you need to hear my voice and you need to let my voice direct you to go to the left or go to the right. You need to hear me, not turn to the world. How many know Egypt is a what? A picture of the world. We need to turn to God. And think how many times we depend on the arm of flesh rather than the arm of our loving Savior, Jesus. John 17, 3, Jesus said this. He says, this is eternal life, that they may know, gnoskos again, intimacy. They may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Do you hear that? It's not saying, hey, this is eternal life. Know the word. Know all the intricacies. He says, this is eternal life, that you may know the one true God and know his son. Isn't that good? Do you hear that? That's it. The reason Jesus died on that cross is for you to have an intimate relationship with him. That's it. Not for you to be a great Bible scholar. It's good to know the word, don't get me wrong, but it's that you would know him. And how many know there's a lot of people that know about God, but they don't know God. And I want to be someone that that knows the word, but sees Jesus in the word and knows the heart of God so that when God comes to me, I don't miss him like the Pharisees. I'm not fighting him. Remember, church, I want to say beloved, but I feel like an old man if I say that. You know, I always hear pastors say, beloved, but I feel like, eh. Anyway, so I just have to say church or guys, sorry. I'm not old enough yet to, well, <laughs> I might look it, but I don't feel that old. Remember to find Jesus in the scriptures and to love him with all your heart and then to love others around you with his love. That's what it's about. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 again. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies and builds up. Hear this. Knowledge wants to always tell you, look what I learned today. Look what I learned in the special Greek. But real love says, hey, what are you going through? How are you doing? How can I minister to you? What, what, what do you need? 
Don't you love people like that? I don't love people that always want to tell me, guess what I learned? Guess what? Guess what? Guess what? Guess what, Pastor? You're wrong. Guess what? Oh, excuse me, Pastor. I don't like that. But I love people who just say, how are you doing, Craig? C- can I pray for you? You know? Is there anything you need? And that's the way we should. Think if we all came to church instead of saying, love me. I hope this church loves me today. What if we came to this church saying, I want to be used by you, God, to love someone here. I want to be used by you to encourage someone. I want to be more concerned about blessing others than others blessing me. How many know Proverbs 11 says, those who refresh others, they themselves shall be refreshed. You try to look for refreshing, won't get it. Right? But you go to bless, guess what? Someone's going to go, hey, I'm sorry, excuse me. I've trumped you. I bless you. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that in life? I always says, whenever I want someone to tell me good job in the sermon, never get it. But when I'm, the few times I'm humble, and I just go, man, Lord, I hope I did my best, but I don't know. Then people say, that was amazing. And I'm like, huh? That was the worst sermon ever. You see, because I'm not looking for it. I'm just saying, God, I just want to do my best for you, and I just love you, and I want to love your people. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies or builds up. I love what I think what Swindoll said. Love should be, love should set the limits of our Christian liberty. So you need to make sure that when you are doing something, that you're thinking about, I might have liberty in this, but is it fruitful for my neighbor and my friend? Is it fruitful for my brothers and Christian, Christian in Christ? I'll end with this. When I first became a senior pastor, I, I, some of you know I didn't want to be a senior pastor. Some of you say you shouldn't have been. No, but I didn't want to be a senior pastor. I was a youth pastor for 21 years. But I remember as being a senior pastor, I had to make my doctrinal statements and all these things and had to decide what kind of bylaws we're going to have. We we took a lot of it, but some of it we could adjust. And there was an issue about drinking. And some Calvaries say elders shouldn't drink. Elders, meaning the leadership of the church. Deacons can drink. You can be like fish, but no. no. But, uh, But elders can't drink. And some say you can. And so I was deciding whether or not to do that. And I was talking to one of the pastors in town here, and I'll be careful. But this pastor was telling me, in a very strong church, the pastor was telling me that this guy and his church went through rehab and struggled with alcohol. And he struggled all his life for a lot of years. And he just came out of alcohol, and he's going to have this celebration party at a restaurant comes out of the restaurant, and he's having dinner with his wife, and he sees an elder of a church. If I said the church, you'd know it in a second. And he sees this elder drinking a glass of wine. And the man says to his wife, well, honey, see, he can drink. He's a godly man. Why can't I drink? I can just have one glass of wine. Well, this man, if you know people who struggle with alcohol, it's not one glass. It's give me the box, right? And a box of wine. No, but anyway, that's a joke, right? But that's... uh, and, and he got drunk. And then the man takes his wife and he goes and he drives and he goes, blows through a, a, a railroad crossing and almost hits a train. And almost got killed the night, first night out of rehab. And he said, and they go, what happened? The pastor went to visit and he goes, well, I saw your elder drinking and so I felt like that said I could drink. So hear this, guys, because some of you have challenged me about drinking. But I don't do it legalistically. I don't tell, I've even said to the elders, because some elders fought me on it, like, hey, hey, even though I didn't change it midstream, it, from the day one we said we're not going to drink. Just the elders, leaders of the church. And then they say, hey, that's not fair, it's legalism. How many know, no, it's not, because why? I'm not drinking because of love. I'm laying down my right. I have the right to drink. How many of the Bible says you can drink? But it says don't be, get drunk. Right? But I lay down my right to drink because I know that people watch me and what I do in moderation, a lot of people do in excess. So I lay down. Does that make sense to you? I lay down. And so whenever it says, oh, legalism, no, it's not legalism. I could drink. I could drink right now. But I don't. I choose not to drink because I don't. Because let's be real. Can anyone be real? I think I said to one brother, right? if you saw me and the elders at Oregano's and there was a bit, or say it, let's go uh, Applebee's. And you see a big pitcher of beer and a bunch of shots around. I'm going, hey, shots! How many know you'd have a problem with that visual? No wonder he's so fat. Okay, no, you know, you would, you would just go, well, how many, how many have a problem with that visual? You guys are lying. You all would, right? I said, oh my goodness, 
I knew it. I knew it. So guess what? Enough pastors have been a bad example, amen? And by the grace of God, not because I want to look holier than thou, but because I don't want to cause people to stumble. Amen? So, and that's the number one opiate of America. That's the number one stumbling is still alcohol, higher than any other, uh, any other drug or anything. And so guess what? I and my family, both sides, affected dramatically by it. If you come from an alcoholic family, you know what I'm talking about. And so I said, I don't want to bring that in, and I let it go. But do you hear the heart, though? It's love. So just see that as that. Don't, don't see it as legalism. It's, remember I said, what is the motive again? It's all about everything you do, do it in love. Why do I let go of that right? Because I love people. Amen? Why do you let go of your right? Because you love your brother or sister. You don't want to cause them to stumble. You don't want to cause them to freak out and go almost kill themselves in a train crossing. Does that make sense? So that's, that's the heart there. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. I ask that, Father, we would have that heart. Lord, as your word says, they will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. And I ask humbly that you would give us a great love for you first and a great love for each other. And that, Father, Everything we wouldn't, we'd do, it wouldn't be to be, look good in front of people. It wouldn't be to look spiritual or look holier than thou. But it would all be about, I want to love you, God. And I want to love my neighbors, which means near ones. I want to love the person sitting to my right or to my left or the ones I live with. And I want them to know your love through me. I want you to let, show me how to love them, how to come alongside them and encourage them in the ways of God without beating them down, without discouraging them. And so, Father, I thank you. I just want to say I thank you for that you're teaching me that. Even though I've been a Christian a long time, I realize how easy it is to go right back to where you started or even worse. And I say, Lord, if there's anyone like me out there, Lord, bring me back to that first love. Take me into that holy of holies where all the, all the religiousness, all the weirdness goes away and it's only about loving you and loving others with your love. Purify our hearts. Let our motives be right. Let us be like King David, men and women after your own heart, because we want to, we just want to just show you the love you've so lavishly shown us. And then, Lord, we want to just be doers of your word because we love you. So, Lord, bless this church. Bless the other churches in this city that are calling upon you with a pure heart. Let that love of Christ come back to your church to where you just love to be here because it's a church that loves you and loves each other. Bless your people. Let us walk in that liberty of the Spirit, but yet always governed by love that I don't want to use my, my liberty to cause my brother to stumble or sister. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord.
I'm shooting my heart with this love Cause nothing on earth is beautiful as you Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.